Hi, and welcome to our video about coal called Origins and Issues. So coal is really relevant because it's one of the most plentiful and cheap and widely available hydrocarbons in the world. Um, we have a huge supply of it in North America, 246 billion tons, as do China and Russia. So we could continue to power ourselves on coal for hundreds of years. Of course, you may know that coal is a very dirty and inefficient fuel, so hopefully we won't do that, but it's at least worth understanding how coal evolves and why it's so plentiful. So in this video, we'll talk a little bit about the basics of how coal forms, and then we'll finish by looking at a few different types of coal. So unlike oil and gas, coal forms primarily from decomposed remains of plants and trees. Usually these are plants and trees uh, that lived in a swamp environment uh, and died. And because the swamp is very anoxic, there's no oxygen in the water, they weren't able to decay. So we preserve that organic material in the swamp. This is a little bit different than oil and gas that are more commonly formed from uh, finer grained organic material on the bottom of the ocean. So how does this work? Uh, we start with a swamp environment here, something like this, okay? Many swamps have peat, which is actually a type of, of condensed organic material. Um, over time, uh, sea levels may rise or fall, and we may bury that organic peat, that swamp, uh, in sand. And as we start to bury it uh, in deeper and deeper layers of sediment, we start to compact the peat and we heat it and we eventually make coal. And so this is what that might look like. Here's a nice dark coal bed, very organic rich, sandwiched between two layers of sandstone. So this coal has been buried to, who knows, maybe a kilometer or so. And that's pretty typical that we find coal in flat-lying beds um, that are basically the sedimentary record of extensive ancient swamps that have been condensed down into these narrow coal beds. So a really productive time for coal formation was the Pennsylvanian period, about 322 to 300 million years ago. Um, and that's actually part of the, the aptly named Carboniferous period. And this was a time when Earth was very warm and there appears to have been a lot of shallow water uh, marine environments where there was a lot of marine swamps that were extremely productive with trees and vegetation. In the Eastern US, a great example of this is the Appalachian Basin. And we talked in the video about fracking a little bit about the Appalachian Basin, but it basically was this marine embayment that existed off to the west of the Proto-Appalachians. So you can see here uh, at 315 million years ago during the Pennsylvanian, this was really the last gasp of the Appalachian Basin. Um, and we may have had shallow water swamp environments covering parts of Pennsylvania in West Virginia in Ohio. These are areas where we now have a lot of coal that formed from these shallow water uh, marine swamps in the Appalachian Basin. And here's that stratigraphy a little bit. This is a cross section from basically Ohio over into West Virginia. So right across that uh, basin we just looked at. And we have all kinds of uh, stuff that was forming to the west of the Appalachians and being deposited to the west of the Appalachians, including um, this big deltaic wedge, the Catskill Wedge, um, and including things like the Ohio Shale, which are sources for uh, shale gas nowadays. But coal comes mostly from the upper part of this stratigraphy. Um, it's the youngest part, this Pennsylvanian age rocks, um, including things like the Allegheny Formation. So this was a swampy time, and importantly, these rocks were never buried very deep. Maybe they've been buried one or two kilometers, 
but they really haven't been buried very deep at all. Now, it's no coincidence that these sedimentary beds in the upper part of that stratigraphy really lend themselves to strip mining and to mountaintop removal, which we know is so destructive. And the reason is that these coal beds were some of the last things to be deposited, so they're still sitting way up near the surface. And in many times, they're, they're fairly flat lying. Um, therefore, it's pretty cheap for a, a energy company to come in and literally just strip off the top of a mountain. So this ridge line used to extend right through here, and you can see that it's just been stripped right off, exposing this flat-lying layer of coal. And that's easy to do because those coal beds are, are up on top of the stratigraphy, and they're pretty flat. Okay, so let's wind down here by just looking at different types of coal and talk a little bit about energy density. Um, types of coal are referred to by their rank, and there's really four different types of coal. Uh, there's lignite, subbituminous, bituminous, and anthracite. You won't need to remember those names, but what I would like you to remember is that basically uh, these are formed by being buried to different depths. So anthracite is formed by being buried to the greatest depth, perhaps 25,000 feet. And what that means is it's exposed to a much higher temperature, maybe 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. And because it's heated hotter and longer, uh, basically volatiles are driven off. You could imagine that organic material in a swamp is filled with things like water, sulfur, nitrogen, all kinds of nasty stuff. And so as you heat the coal up from lignite up to anthracite, we find that the fraction of water and other volatiles drops a lot. So anthracite, the deeply buried coal, is almost 80% carbon. It's very carbon rich. Whereas lignite is only about 25% carbon. So what that means, if you try to burn lignite, you're basically going to get mostly water and gases coming off. You're not going to get that much energy, whereas anthracite gives you a, a beautiful high energy density. So it's really important to think about what type of coal you might be using as it relates to energy density. And in the United States, we saw we have a huge supply of coal, but it's not all created equally. Um, some of it is anthracite, and a lot of it is this kind of uh, bituminous level, kind of a medium to low energy density. And that's what a lot of the coal is from the Appalachian Basin here, this orange color. It's pretty low energy density. Maybe it's only about 50% carbon by mass, so really not very high. And that's because it wasn't buried very deep. It was deposited on the top of that stratigraphy. Um, and that's a little bit different for some of the western coal, where we see coal that was buried uh, a bit more deeply. So finally, uh, coal also isn't created equally in terms of impurities. Uh, and, and impurities like sulfur matter a lot. Uh, if you burn coal with high sulfur, um, you're going to get sulfur dioxide gas which is the precursor to acid rain. So sulfur is really bad um, and has been a problem for many decades. And what we see here is that some of the western coal that was mostly deposited in younger freshwater environments is very low in sulfur, whereas a lot of this eastern coal that was mostly deposited in older marine environments, like the Appalachian Basin, uh, is pretty high in sulfur. So it's kind of low energy density, pretty high in sulfur. It's really not great. So in summary, uh, coal is very plentiful, very cheap. It forms from plant remains in swamps. Um, shallow marine basins created ideal conditions for coal during the Pennsylvania period, uh, namely the Appalachian Basin. Uh, coal is very low energy density, 
has many impurities, but the deeper you bury it, uh, the higher that energy density gets. Here's a couple concept questions, and thanks for listening.